And for the rest of us, would you take and open your Bibles to Romans chapter 8? As we continue in Romans chapter 8, we'll be reading from verses 12 down through verse 17. Romans 8, verses 12 through 17. Therefore, dear brothers, you have no obligation to do what your sinful nature urges you to do. For if you live by its dictates, you will die. But if through the power of the Spirit you put to death the deeds of your sinful nature, you will live. For all who are led by the Spirit of God are children of God. So you have not received a spirit that makes you fearful slaves, but instead you received God's Spirit when he adopted you as his own children. And now we call him Abba, Father. For his Spirit joins with our spirit to affirm that we are God's children. And since we're his children, we are his heirs. In fact, together with Christ, we are heirs to God's glory. But if we're to share his glory, we must also share his suffering. Would you pray with me? Father, we thank you for your word, which is alive and true. And Lord, how you use your your word, God, to shape and mold our, our heart and soul and conform us more and more in the image of Christ. I pray, Father, that you would continue to teach us this morning uh, through this portion of Scripture. May your Holy Spirit be free to speak that which we need to hear. Uh, Father, we sang a a song of declaration. I'm not a slave to fear anymore, but rather I'm a child of God. Father, may we find that to be true, and we have the love of the Father leading us, steering us, helping us to become all that he wants us to be. We thank you that we can come to you in this way, and we pray it all in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, amen. Amen. Just before I move into the message this morning, I just want to give a word of testimony and praise to the Lord. Uh, Some of you, as you came in, know that we've been praying for uh, the Lathrop family, and especially for Gary, and um, I was reminded at the door, uh, the testimony, just to say, you know, we had a, a miracle really happen in our family this week. And you might remember with me about a week ago, uh, Gary had some stroke-like symptoms and it required some medical intervention and then several surgeries, not one but two uh, forms of brain surgery. And yet this morning, Gary's home and he's with Connie and uh, doing speech therapy outpatient. And so we went from something that looked uh, devastating to something that has tremendous hope and, and God has ministered healing and health in the midst of that. And we just want to say, Lord, thank you. And I know Gary's story is not the only one. There are people I'm looking at here this morning. You have your story of how God met you in those places as well. We want to be careful to give thanks to the Lord and acknowledge he does these things. When we talk about the spirit of God and the spirit of power and healing, he's at work in so many ways. This portion of scripture this morning invites us to consider yet another way that God's spirit wants to minister to our hearts. So every morning, two seven-year-olds, a boy and a girl, would meet up so they could walk to school together. The little girl made jokes and the little boy kept laughing at him. Uh, He would show off and she would one-up him. Their friendship just blossomed, but what he couldn't hear from her was some of the dark things that were happening in her home. Brooklyn had seen a lot of depravity in her seven years of life, more than most. Her home was a place where the parents regularly argued, where there were physical altercations, where sometimes Brooklyn put herself between her mom and her dad and shouted for them to stop. She saw open drug use and sexual behavior that kept her awake at night and behind locked doors. But in the morning, she would get up and she would get ready and she'd get ready to meet her friend and just walk to school and try to have a normal day. Can you picture that? This is Brooklyn's life. And then one day, she woke up and there were flashing lights and there were EMTs and others in her home and she discovered that her father had overdosed on drugs. And life took an even deeper downward spiral because mom couldn't handle it and she turned to those same drugs and just went deeper and deeper. Strangers came into that house all the time. Again, Brooklyn found only safety behind locked doors in her bedroom. One day, 
her friend from school, his grandparents, Mark and Colette, stopped by the house for a play date to pick her up. And when they came, they, they stepped in the house, and there was trash everywhere and dirty dishes and just mayhem everywhere. And Brooklyn's mom really wasn't saying a lot, sitting on the couch, not saying a whole lot of anything. And they realized that this, this is what Brooklyn lived with always. And Mark and Colette were just broken in their hearts, and they, they wanted to reach out and help in some way. So they began to come alongside Brooklyn's mom, and they would do things like paying her rent and <clears throat> buying some groceries and some other kinds of things. But, but they realized just putting money in her hands wasn't working because, sadly, she took that same money and used it to feed her drug habit over here. And Brooklyn didn't get the care that she needed. Things get from bad to worse, and, and finally... <clears throat> Um, Child Protection Services got involved and they took Brooklyn out of the house because it was a great danger to her. And they placed her uh, within the foster system for a brief time. But they were looking for someone who might care for her and they actually turned around and reached out to her friend, her seven-year-old friend's parents to say, would you consider having Brooklyn come and stay with you? Well, they had just moved to the country and in a new home, and more than that, they had a little tiny baby that they just welcomed into their home. They couldn't do it. But this young couple cared about Brooklyn so much, they turned around and they phoned their parents, Mark and Clint, and said, Mom, Dad, would you consider letting Brooklyn come to you and be safe with you? 30 minutes later, Brooklyn was on their doorstep, and they took wide open arms and welcomed her in. Those first three months that she spent with them were sweet. This is her new family. But there was deep trauma inside of her. And as she felt more safe, more and more of that came out. And so there was screaming when she was frustrated. There was self-harm that was happening. There was all kinds of things starting to go on. And Mark and Colette were at their wit's end because they had not experienced this with raising their own children. What do we do for Brooklyn? How do we help her be safe? How do we help her know that she's loved and cared for, that she's welcomed here? And so they just poured it out, did what they knew to do. One day they heard about Childbridge, which is a partner agency that we partner with as a community agency. And they went and they got some coaching that they really needed to parent this young girl. Brooklyn's 10 now. This is Nana and Papa. This is her family. And she feels that love. And she's been welcomed in with open arms and wrapped around her. And they've just loved on her to a place of, those, despite those emotional scars, yes, they're there. But nonetheless, there's been the healing power of Christ that's been brought to bear. And God has given these grandparents that could be empty nesters and doing other kinds of stuff, given them fresh power and energy to pour into this little girl and say, we want you to know that you're loved, you're treasured, you're cared for. We are here for you. It's a precious story, isn't it? A true story taken from one of Childbridge's uh, stories of children that have received some foster care but ultimately became part of a family and were really adopted in and became permanent guardians. Mark and Coletta became permanent guardians for Brooklyn. She knows she has a family where she's treasured and she's loved. Friends, Brooklyn's story can be your story and my story. Because you see, the brokenness that she experienced as part of living in a fallen, broken world, and we know that's the result of sin, and God knows that that's true of your life and my life. We have tremendous brokenness in our lives, too, because of sin. And every one of us have that kind of a story that we could tell. There, there's all this peace that's around us that, that it's not what it should be. And, and yet here's God with open arms welcoming us into his family and saying, I love you because you're my son, you're my daughter and he adopts us into his family. God's word this morning invites us to understand what it is to be reconciled and to be adopted into the family of God. And it was prayed for earlier this morning. It was sung in song. It was read in scripture. The price that was paid was the sacrifice of God's one and only son on the cross so that you and I might be brought into that family. That the spirit of of sonship or adoption would be extended to you and I. And as we look at this portion of Scripture this morning, we're being reminded that God says, there's a place at my table for you. 
I treasure you. I want you here with me. You're my son, you're my daughter. And we need to hear those words again. Again, think about Romans 8, where we've been so far. This, this chapter started with those words, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. To those who belong to the Lord Jesus Christ, no condemnation, but rather welcome opening arms of mercy and grace from our Heavenly Father. As we read on past verse 4 through verses 5 through 8, we're reminded now we're not to live our lives where we're under the control of the sinful nature that takes us away from God and puts us in a posture of disobedience and rebellion, but rather we're to live under the power and control of the Holy Spirit. And that that's how God would have us to live. He wants us to live that way. And remember last week we talked about how things are black and white in God's word. And so you're either in or you're out. You either belong to Jesus or you don't. There's no middle ground. There's no fence sitting. It's very black and white. And so the scripture says those who have the spirit of God belong to Christ. Because it's only through the spirit that we're born again. The Spirit of God who causes us to come to new life in Christ as we put our faith in him. As we come now to verse 12 and following, we've got a transition here because Paul one more time comes back and talks about the sinful nature and the spirit and the, the uh, competition that's there between them, if you will, and says, listen, there's, there's a, a, a therefore again. You know what to do with that. Therefore, okay, that's a conclusion. What are we concluding now? We have an obligation, Paul says, but it's not to... Uh, not to the sinful nature and to live according to it. So, so the responsibility that you and I have in Christ Jesus is to live our life fully for Christ. We're not to indulge the urges of our sinful nature. We have no obligation to go there. We're no longer slaves to sin. We're not forced to go there. We have a way of escape. We have a different way of living. The way of the Spirit is fully available to us because of Christ and the price that he paid on the cross. And so the scripture says we have no obligation, we have no debt, no, nothing that we have to pay back to sin nature because we're being forced to do something. No, we're free of all of that. The only debt that you and I have, Romans 13, 8 says, is we have a debt to love the people around us with the same love that God loved us. That's the only debt that we have. So we can resist these urges and passions of our sinful nature and we can refuse to cave into it. We can be dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ by choosing life through the Spirit. Have you seen a dog fight before? We, we probably ran into a couple of those, right? And, and usually you've got a smaller dog, bigger dog. That's often the case. And usually the little dog's telling the bigger dog what he thinks, right? And so you've got a fight going on. But the one that... that absolutely wins that battle is the alpha dog, the one who proves that they truly are the big dog in the room. God's word is telling us your sin nature may make a lot of noise and be yappy, but it is not the alpha dog. The Holy Spirit controls. The Holy Spirit has power and authority. And we're not to live our lives in, in an uh, obligation to the sin nature, but rather to choose life through the Spirit. And so verse 13 says, if by the Spirit you put to death the misdeeds of the body, you will live. Now let me hit pause for one moment. Let me just kind of step over here and say, as you're looking at this portion of Scripture, this is saying to us very clearly, while you are new in Christ, you're a new person in Christ, you have salvation in Christ. You belong to Christ. If you have the Spirit of God, you put your faith in Jesus. While that is all true, you still have a sin nature. The Scripture does not teach that the sin nature is eradicated by salvation. There's an ongoing battle. That's what Romans 7 is talking about, isn't it? The Apostle Paul saying, I've got this battle, this stuff that's going on, and, and I know what it is, and it's sin living in me. I'm alive in Christ, and yet I'm doing these things I know I ought not to do and don't want to do, but I find myself doing it anyway. Romans 7. But there's no condemnation, Romans 8, 1, for those who are in Christ Jesus, because God says, I have a way for you to overcome that. It's called live by the Spirit. You live in the power of the Spirit. And so the scripture reminds us that we're to embrace that life in the spirit. Titus 3, 5 says that we've been saved through the washing of rebirth and renewal by the Holy Spirit when he poured uh, generously out on us through Jesus Christ, our Savior. 
So these sinful nature that we have, everybody has, even if you're in Christ, you still have that sin nature because you have a mortal body. And this body has been corrupted by sin. And until God gives us that new body, which the scripture says much about the new body, that which is immortal, that which is made for eternity, there's this great exchange. We get rid of the old and we get the new. Until we get to that place, we have this battle while we have life and breath on this earth. And the way to live that life is by embracing the crucified life. So look with me again. That scripture says, if by the spirit you put to death the misdeeds of the body, you will live. And you might hear that and be reminded of Romans chapter 6, verses 11 to 14, where it says, reckon yourself, consider yourself what? Dead to sin, but alive to Christ Jesus, right? Alive to God through Christ Jesus. So uh, dead to sin, alive to God in Christ Jesus. And, and at first you might say, well, that means I just have to try harder. I just got to work harder. Yes and no. Yes, you and I are involved in that by an act of our willpower. We're involved. We're not just puppets on a string. We have to decide to live by the Spirit. We have to determine that by an act of our will. But no, I don't have what it takes to live by the Spirit. I need the Spirit of God to be God's power in me, all that I need there. And so there's a cooperation between myself and the Spirit of God living in me, and together we work together in tandem, and the Spirit supplies what's needed so that we can live a life of victory. And so that comes about through what's called the crucified life. Again, if by the Spirit you put to death the misdeeds of the body, you will live. There's some language that's been used in the church for a long time to de de describe this life that we're talking about. I'm using the word crucified life because it's clear that that's what's being talked about right here in this text. But sometimes you'll hear words like the deeper life, the Christ life, the spirit-filled life, the exchanged life. All of those are ways of trying to describe what this is about. The key is to embrace the mortifying of our bodies. The word mortify means to put to death, it means for something to die. And what we're inviting the Lord to do by his spirit is for him to take the hammer and the nails and nail that sinful nature to the cross in that moment of temptation where we're wanting to indulge, we're wanting to go in that direction we know we ought not to go, and we're saying, Holy Spirit, put that to death. I choose death to sin, but I want to be alive and tender to you. I want to be focused on you. That's mortifying. That's the crucified life. And so we practice that, mortifying of the flesh, Dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ. And it requires a full surrender to the Spirit of God. If you're to read Cliff's notes on Romans, do you know where that is in Scriptures? It's called Galatians, right? Galatians is five chapters, Romans is 16. Galatians has the essence of Romans in it. But if you're to read in Galatians you would read once again in Galatians chapter 5, it talks about now live by the Spirit, keep in step with the Spirit, go in that direction. Because the problem for the Galatians, again, that Paul brings out is you started with the Spirit of God, and now you're trying to live the Christian life in your own power. How's it going? Not well. I keep hitting them all. I keep doing the stuff I ought not to be doing. And God says, I know that about you. But as my son and daughter know that I've given you what you need in the power of the Holy Spirit, you have what you need to live a life of victory and triumph over sin. And so we need to come back to that full surrender to the Spirit of God to move from the wretched man experience of Romans 7 to the no condemnation of Romans 8 and know that there comes this kind of this crisis where we're just going... God, I'm at that place, and I just, I'm desperate for you in all of your fullness, and I'm crying out for that. Galatians 5 and verse 24 says, Those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the sinful nature with his passions and desires. If you read ahead in Romans chapter 12, verse 1 and 2, it talks about in light of God's mercy, offer yourselves, your bodies, as a living sacrifice to the Lord. And the aorist tense there says, this is being written to Christians saying, we need to come to a place of crisis to say, Lord, I'm all yours. I'm fully yours. And, and there's this one moment that represents that drive the stake in the ground. and says, God, yes, here at this point. But now from that point forward, daily I come back and renew that again. The crucified life is daily 
taking up your cross, daily being crucified to sin and alive to God. <clears throat> so as we're hearing this, as we're thinking about this, I was trying to, um, in my mind at least, think through how, how does this all work. So 1 Timothy 4 talks about training in godliness. So there's the crisis and then there's this process, right? 1 Timothy 4, 7 and 8, uh, this training in godliness has great value, both now and forever. And, and so we want God to make us more and more like Christ, more holiness, more godliness in us through his spirit. That's 1 Timothy 4. Galatians 2.20, Paul describes his story. I've been crucified with Christ. I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. And so this life that I live in the body, this life in the body with this sinful nature, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me, and I commit myself to him daily, constantly. Some of you have been, I'll put it this way. Some of you stood on a platform like this and said, I do, on a wedding day. Remember? On that wedding day, there was a commitment that was made, a full surrender one to another. And in that time of promise and the exchange of rings, you're committing yourself to lifelong devotion to your spouse, and in so doing, you're saying, and I'm dead to all others. I'm dead to other relationships with anyone else in that same way. It's only to my spouse. I'm committed to the one and dead to all others. And on that day, there was a commitment made. There was a stake driven in the ground. And that's a precious day and an incredible moment, right? A time of full surrender in public through that exchange of vows that says, I do. But friends, if you just say, well, I remember when I said that, and that's, that's what counted, and that was it, and you never revisit that, and you never come back to that and recognize, I have to make this same commitment every day. Every day, I die to others and commit myself to my spouse. Every day, I do that so that I might encourage and develop uh, intimacy in that relationship and a depth in that relationship that belongs there. And so every day, this is what it takes until there's daily renewal of surrender and commitment that one time at the altar is not enough. It has to be renewed daily and constantly. And so every morning, when you wake up, you renew that commitment. And I gotta tell you, it's costly. It takes a lot. Your will has to be involved, and the Spirit of God needs to be working in that. Now, that's true in a marriage relationship, and I think God's wanting us to remember, no, that's true in the relationship between myself and the bride, the church, in the same way. And so this crucified life, this Spirit-filled life, is one of commitment to the Lord, asking for the fullness of His Spirit, and then daily coming back and saying, Lord, more of you. Renew, refresh. Remember what we, we've talked about this language a little bit, right? The last couple of weeks, we're cracked pots. Remember that part? We're clay. We leak. We need the fresh in filling the Holy Spirit. We keep coming back to that. That's not a bad thing. It's a good thing. It says, Lord, I can't do this on my own. I need you, and I need the fullness of you to do that. And so marriage is a tremendous picture of, of it's so worth it, but the sacrifice that needs to be made. Live by the Spirit. The obligation goes in one direction, not to satisfy the sin nature, but rather to walk in obedience and in step with the Holy Spirit. Notice how Paul shifts everything in verse 14. Because those who are led by the Spirit of God are sons and daughters of God. Paul says, listen, this is what happens when you belong to the family of God, when you're walking in obedience to the Spirit of God, your story begins to sound like Brooklyn's story where God brings healing and wholeness into your life. It starts by following the Spirit's leading. I'm not sure about you, but um, Patrick uh, Mayberry's got a song called Lead on Good Shepherd. Kind of enjoy that song. It's based on Psalm 23, but what it does is it takes the imagery of the shepherd again leading his sheep to the green pastures and the quiet waters and there my soul is restored and filled and the Lord says listen if you're children of God then you're following in step with the Holy Spirit as he leads you follow you walk in his footsteps you're going to walk according to the will of God in obedience to God 
So we follow the Spirit's leaving. There's, there's evidence and proof that the Spirit's in us. We live life in the Spirit's fullness. Jesus said, if you have the Spirit within you, streams of living water will flow from your hearts, John 7 and verse 38. Jesus said, I came that you could have the abundant life, John 10 and verse 10. By the way, there's another one of those phrases, right? Abundant life, deeper life, Christ life, exchanged life, crucified life, all trying to describe the same thing. Live in the fullness of God's Spirit. <clears throat> Ephesians 5.18, coming back and be continually filled with the Spirit. Again, that's um, God's Word tells us we need to come back constantly. And then notice how in verse 15, our spirit is affirmed by God's Spirit that we belong. You did not receive a spirit, makes you a slave again to fear, but you received the spirit of sonship, and by him we cry, Abba, Father. Think about the difference between being a slave and being a son or daughter being family. A slave driven by fear. What if the master doesn't like what I did? What if if the master's going to do something to me? Fear driven. A father who loves unconditionally, deeply. A son, a daughter knows that love, embraced by that love. It's Mark and Coletta extending that love to Brooklyn and offering her hope and a future. We live in the Spirit's fullness. We also are affirmed in our spirit that we belong To the Father. The Spirit Himself, in verse 16 says, testifies with ours that we are God's children. I want you to remember something. God's Word says, by the presence of two or three witnesses, something's confirmed as true. Notice how our Spirit has confirmation from God's Spirit that we belong to Him. Two or three witnesses. It's true. And so we belong in that way. How does God express that? Well, it's expressed. In that, in his great love, he predestined us, the scripture says, Ephesians 1, 5, to be adopted as his sons. And in the Bible, where it says sons there, it means sons and daughters. You understand that? In the culture of the day, you would use the masculine terminology, but it describes both men and women both. All right? So as sons or sons and daughters, through Jesus Christ, in accordance with his pleasure and will. Galatians 4, when the time had fully come, God sent his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those under the law that we might receive the full rights as sons, and you can add this, and daughters, right? Because you are sons and daughters, God sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, the spirit who calls out Abba, Father. So you're no longer a slave, but a son, a daughter. And because that's true, you're also an heir. Isn't that incredible? That God would welcome us into his family in such a way. And invite us to live in the power of his spirit. And as we do so, and as God affirms that we belong to him, the scripture says, and you're a joint heir with Jesus. You have an inheritance. See, Paul is following the the Roman adoption laws, if you will, which in Rome, if you were adopted into the family, you received full rights as a son or a daughter. But certainly as a son in particular, you can inherit everything that belonged to your adoptive father, your legitimate heir. And Paul says, not only do you belong, but the Heavenly Father says, and this is for you. The unsearchable riches of Christ belong to you and I. We have free access to the throne of mercy and grace in the Holy of Holies. We can come anytime in Jesus' name. We have, we have all of heaven's resources at our disposal. We have a future glory of being in eternity with God. All of this becomes ours because we become heirs as part of God's forever family. And some of you are maybe humming in your mind right now, I'm so glad that I'm a part of the family of God. What an incredible blessing that is, that God would call us his very own. But I want you to notice verse 17. Verse 17 says, if indeed we share in his sufferings, so that we might also share in his glory. What Paul is saying is, we have the gifting from the Lord. We have the power of God's Spirit. We have everything we need. But friends, it's a costly walk. And to walk with Jesus in a fallen, broken world that is hostile to God and hostile to those who are God followers, know that it will cost you. But it's worth it. If we will share in his sufferings, finish our race of faith, and not stop, not quit, when we get to the end, glory is waiting. And that's what God wants us to hear this morning. Think about what God has done that you and I can be called his sons and daughters.
in exchange for your life and mine, he offered Jesus. Christ volunteered, gave himself fully, completely, dying on that cross, but shedding his blood. He had no reason to die. He had not done anything wrong, sinful. He's the very son of God, and yet he made that determination to make that exchange. He did that for you and I. Invites us to trust him. Place our lives in his hands. And then begin to walk a life that's pleasing to him. And friends, it is more than possible to please God. Do not in any way have in your mind that God is just waiting to take you out to the woodshed with a big stick. That's how some people look at their Heavenly Father. That is not what the Scripture says. The Scripture says that He loved us so much that while we were still sinners, He gave His Son. He said, I want you with me. I want you as my son and my daughter. It's a Brooklyn story, isn't it? Where the Heavenly Father shows up on the doorstep and says, I see the mess, I see it all, but I want you with me and I'm going to do what it takes to make it possible. The spirit of adoption, the spirit of sonship, sons and daughters of God. By the way, God says, if you're my son and you're my daughter, please understand I expect you to live like one. Live like family, right? Right? By the Spirit, in the power of the Spirit. Why might God be saying to you this morning, our worship team is going to come. They're leading us in a final uh, song that's a prayer, really. Um, But I just want you thinking about this this morning and say, Lord, what are you saying to me this morning? Is it that I need to drive the stake in the ground and make sure that I belong to Christ, I put my faith in Christ, and I have the Spirit of God living in me? Perhaps that, if that's where you are, that's that very first step. That's a necessary step. Perhaps you've didn't, taken that step, but you're saying, Lord, I've been trying to do this Christian life on my own power and strength, and, and I keep hitting the wall, and, and I realize you're just inviting me to come and, and receive the fullness that's already mine. It's already available to me. Luke eleven thirteen 13 says, the Heavenly Father will give the Holy Spirit to those who ask. The fullness of the Spirit is available. Or maybe this morning you're just simply saying, Lord, that, that fresh and filling, I just want to please you as my Heavenly Father. And I just, I'm reminded again, I'm asking this morning, not for that infilling for the first time, but rather, God, just a renewing, a renewing, a refreshing, more of you. Yesterday we were walking up in the Bighorns. A bunch of us had a great time. Austin looks like she survived, so that's good. There you go. Here's what was true in the Bighorn Mountains. That scorching sun that you and I feel down here is drying out those mountains fast. But God's made a provision through the snow and the ice that melts slow and it continues to feed all those flowers, all the things we enjoy up in the mountains, keep it green, so on. It just continues to be there. It's God's provision. And in a similar way, he says, I provided everything you need in Christ Jesus. The Spirit of God is fully yours, fully available You need only ask, what might God be saying? Breathe on us, Spirit of the living God.